But as I said, what I really want to focus more on today now is this question of the transition from slave labor to free labor. The end of slavery produces a tremendous variety of, of, of systems in the situations in the South. It's very complicated and confusing. But everybody understood or had this feeling of, in, of going through a revolutionary sort of change. I, this is, I want to read you from the diary of Louis Manigo. He was a very well-to-do planter in South Carolina and Georgia, rice plantations, cotton plantations, and he visited in 1867 one of his plantations on the Savannah River. And he says, um, I imagined myself for the moment a planter once more, followed by overseer and driver. But these were only passing momentary thoughts, soon dispelled by the sad reality of affairs. In my conversation with these Negroes, now free, my thoughts turned to other countries. I almost imagined myself with Chinese, Malays, or Indians in the interior of the Philippine Islands. The mutual and pleasant feeling of master towards slave and vice versa is now a dream of the past. A very interesting, odd comment. First of all, we may doubt whether the slaves shared the mutual and pleasant feeling <laughs> that, that he thought he had toward them. But m things are so alien that Manigo has to search for analogies. Malays, he'd never been to Malaysia. Indians in the interior of the Philippine Islands. In other words, this is about as different a situation as he can imagine. The, the whole system there has, has fallen apart. It's totally, the whole, the relationship between master and slave of white and black is now completely foreign to him. Um, well, the struggle here is about who's going to own the land and who's going to determine what kind of labor is done on the land. As I mentioned, the land issue began in the Civil War, remember, with taxation imposed by the federal government on the states, tax commissioners, land seizures, and the sale of some land, not a lot, in the Sea Islands some, to pay these taxes. It also began with the Confiscation Acts, which in theory opened the property of uh, rebels to confiscation, although it required a judicial proceeding to do that, which would have been awfully time cumbersome and complicated. And then there was Sherman's Field Order Number 15, which just did distribute land to significant numbers of African Americans on the coast of South Carolina and Georgia in these 40-acre units. Now, one of the first things in the summer of 1865, one of the first things that President Andrew Johnson does when he comes into office after Lincoln's assassination is to order the restoration of all this land back to the pre-war owners, except land that had actually been sold which was a very, very small proportion. So the guys on the Sea Island who bought that land kept it. But all the Sherman land is going to go back to the former owners. Any land on which there were other places in Virginia, North Carolina, some other places where blacks had been settled on land, Davis Bend, remember, out in uh, Mississippi, all that land is to be restored to the former owners. Once they've been pardoned, and Johnson starts pardoning them all very, very fast, so that's not a problem. Um, and so you, and now, the Freedmen's Bureau head in South Carolina, Rufus Saxton, a general who was an abolitionist, condemned this, he protested, he said this was an egregious breach of faith with the slave, former slaves to promise them land and then take it away. Um, but there was not much that anyone could do, this was Johnson's order, and so, by the end of 1865, most of this land that was in the hands of the federal government, much of it being tilled by black workers, was to being restored. They said, you can stay there until the harvest this year, but as of January 1st, the owners are coming back to take over uh, uh, ownership of the land. General O.O. O. Howard, the head of the Freedmen's Bureau, made a famous trip to Edisto Island one of the sea islands in which he addressed gathering of slaves, telling them that, they would, that the owners were coming back and they would have to sign labor. If they wanted to stay, they would have to sign labor contracts to go to work for the owners and, the, and give up the idea of land. 
Now, there, this didn't just happen uh, overnight or peacefully. There was a lot of uh, resistance in the Sea Islands and elsewhere, particularly in coastal uh, South Carolina and Georgia and the islands. Um, slaves, former slaves, barricaded themselves on plantations, took up arms, tried, they had to send the Union Army in, in some places, to disrupt these protests of former slaves not wanting to give up the land that they said, they, had, they considered that they had been promised this land. Now, Sherman, of course, had not 100% promised that they would own it forever. He was settling them on it. It was rather ambiguous. The Freedmen's Bureau bill was rather ambiguous, but certainly they thought they'd been promised this land. Moreover, the planters had abandoned the area. Now they were coming back. So in 1865, uh, there was no one there to challenge them until uh, uh, Johnson orders this back. And um, also, this Sea Island area is the home of a very close-knit black community, a very unique black community, which dated way back into the 18th century. They had their own language, which we call Gullah, I don't know if anyone's ever visited down there, a particular dialect with a lot of African uh, influence. They, they, so there was a very tight-knit community there. They hadn't been sold away in the way that people from there, in the way that people had in many other parts of the South. Um, Stephen Elliott, a planter returning to Beaufort, uh, was greeted by his slaves who said, there's a letter from me, he said, they told me, we own this land now, put it out of your head that it will ever be yours again. But unfortunately, they didn't have the ability to enforce that idea. One of the often quoted documents in this, very revealing document in this era is a petition that a group of slaves on the Sea Islands sent to President Andrew Johnson and to Howard, the head of the Freedmen's Bureau, uh, about this land question. And I just want to read you a couple of sentences from this often quoted petition. This is to Howard. General, we want homesteads. We were promised homesteads by the government. If the government does not carry out its, the promises its agents made to us, if the government, having concluded to befriend its late enemies and neglect to observe the principle of common faith between itself and us, its allies in the war you said was over, if the government now takes away all right to the soil they stand upon, save such as they can get again by working for your late and their all-time enemies, we are left in a more unpleasant condition than our former slavery. Now, I just want to point out some of the language here, which is quite remarkable, actually, and very revealing about what's going on in Reconstruction. First of all, they say, the war you said was over. Howard comes down and says the war is over. The war between planter and former slave is not over. That war is still going on. The war between North and South is over. Howard says the war is over. From the point of view of these former slaves, there is, the war is not over by any means. The government is now befriending its late enemies, the, the former Confederates, and therefore not its former allies. And the other phrase, your late, working for your late and their all-time enemies. The planters were the enemies of the North, now they're not, but they are the all-time enemies. There is an irrepressible conflict between master and slave, which continues over into the freedom era. So these guys have a pretty clear recognition of what is going on, much clearer than O.O. Howard did or Andrew, well, Johnson had a clear idea, as we'll see, but he wanted to side with the planters, so that, that was not a problem. But certainly, the whole goal of the, this is the crisis of free labor here, the goal of the, uh, of the Freedmen's Bureau is to reconcile the interests of former master and former slave, but they are telling him they are irreconcilable. Their interests are irreconcilable. And if that's the case, it's, it poses a lot of problems for Reconstruction.